Hello, everybody, and, and welcome to uh, the seminar series uh, sponsored by CBRA and the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland's Inflation Center. I'm Dominic Smith, one of the organize, organizers of this series, along with Rafael Shunla. And without further ado, let me hand this off to the moderator, Hugh Montag, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, who will discuss the format and introduce the presenters. Take it away, Hugh. Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending, everyone. The topics of today's sessions are two papers. Only something I don't already know, learning in low and high inflation settings, and inflation preferences. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the organizers, uh, Rafael Shunli at Brandeis University and Dominic Smith at the BLS for uh, putting together this session. This webinar is going to be 45 minutes and will end at 11.45 a.m. Uh, there will be two presentations, each of which will be 15 minutes, and there will be a 10 to 15 minute uh, Q&A session at the end. Attendees don't have, don't have the ability to switch on their audio or video, but they are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. Um, you can, uh, attendees can post these questions during the, during the presentations, and they don't have to wait until the presentations conclude. After both presentations are over, I will select some questions from the Q&A portion of the, of the webinar and uh, field them towards the presenters. This webinar will also be, is also live streamed uh, via the Zebra YouTube channel, and it will be recorded and made available on the Zebra website, uh, www.zebra.org, and the Zebra YouTube channel after the event. Finally, before we uh, start the presentations, a quick disclaimer. Participation in a CBRA webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation, or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other any other participating institution, individual, or entity. All views expressed during a CBRA or CBRA hosted event are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participants, and not those of CBRA, the co-sponsoring institutions, or any other participating institution. <sighs> okay, and with that, um, Ali or Olivier Coibion, um, a professor of economics at University of Texas Austin, will uh, present "Tell Me Something I Don't Already Know: Learning in Low and High Inflation Settings." Ali. So y'all, uh, you can see my my slides. Yeah, looks All right, great. terrific. Well, uh, thank you very much for for having me. I'm very pleased to be here to present this paper with uh, eleven co-authors. Uh, given that there's caveats, uh, we do not speak for the ECB, the Atlanta Fed, the Central Bank of Uruguay, or the Bank of of Italy. Uh, so this paper is going to be about the attentiveness of, of agents. And so there's there's a, a growing literature that's interested in studying departure from full information, rational expectations. You can depart from that in two directions. One is to break the rational expectations part. The other is to break the, the full information part. And when, when you break the full information part, you know, you have theories of why agents would be less than fully attentive. And in general, in those theories, there's there's a choice that's being made about just how inattentive uh, you want to be, and that's going to depend on kind of the cost and the, the benefits of, of doing so. Uh, but in, in, in all cases, what's going to happen is that the degree of inattention should be endogenous to economic uh, conditions. And so recently, there's been a number of papers that have uh, tackled this question of how does the degree of inattention vary with economic conditions, particularly with the level of inflation. I don't have time to talk about uh, these papers in, in detail. I just want to mention one, which is this beautiful paper by Alberto Cavallo and his, and his co-authors. And what they did is they ran an RCT on households in Argentina and the U.S. at the same time. And in this RCT, what they did is they took a randomly selected subset of households in each of those two countries and gave them information about uh, recent inflation rates. And the idea is when you tell people about recent inflation, if they're not aware of what's been going on with inflation dynamics, that new information should lead them to change their beliefs. 
And so what they found in this paper was when you do this RCT in the U.S. and you tell people uh, what inflation has been, you have a very large effect on their inflation expectations, as if they didn't know what this about uh, about this information. Whereas when you do this in Argentina, what they found was you basically have no effect on households' inflation expectations in Argentina. And the story they told for this is, is a very intuitive one, which is well, Argentina has a long history of high inflation. And so in a high inflation environment, households are going to be paying attention to inflation. If you tell them what inflation is, they already know it and it doesn't have any effect on their beliefs. Whereas in a low inflation environment like the U.S., households will be inattentive. If you tell them what inflation has been, it'll change their, their beliefs. And so you can think of their results as being kind of summarized in, in this figure, right? Where you have on the vertical axis, the size of these treatment effects from this RCP, okay? We're gonna use an inverted scale uh, for these purposes. And so you have Argentina here being the high inflation environment that has small treatment effects. And the US is the low inflation environment that has large treatment effects, right? And so their story is as you move from low inflation to high inflation, these treatment effects get smaller as people become uh, more informed. And so this evidence we thought was, was amazing. You know, the only downside is you only have two observations here, right? So we're attributing all of this difference in treatment effects to the difference in, in the inflation environments. But of course, anytime you look across two countries, there's a number of other factors that can be at work. You know, so for example, if, if in Argentina, governments have a history of manipulating inflation statistics, it could be that households are going to dismiss recent inflation numbers, not because they know them, but because they just don't think that they're reliable information, right? So ideally, what we'd like here is a whole lot more var variation than just uh, these two observations. And that's what we're going to do uh, in this paper. We're going to do two things. So one is we're going to add countries to this. So we're going to have more cross-sectional variation. Uh, but of course, with cross-country comparisons, you always worry about, well, what are all the different factors, other factors that can explain differences that we observe? So what you can also do, and what we're going to do, is we're going to look at the time variation within a country. So we're going to take the USA, and we're going to look at what happens to treatment effects as the U.S. goes from a low inflation environment to a high inflation environment. We're going to ask, does this pattern continue to hold? Okay, so we're going to do this uh, kind of time variation within a country for the US, we're gonna do it for households and firms. We're gonna do it in the Euro area for households and for firms in Italy. And what we're gonna find across all these settings is that the results of Cavallo and co-authors extend to the setting. So if you have a, a low inflation environment in a country and you're consistently getting these large treatment effects, when the inflation rate rises significantly in that country, we're gonna find that the treatment effects go down. Okay, that's going to be true uh, across the across the board. What we're also going to do is look at other countries uh, that are kind of that are going to be a little different. So one that's really interesting is we're going to have firms in Uruguay, and Uruguay for us is like the Argentina case. This is the country with high inflation. But what's nice is we're going to have repeated RCTs in Uruguay where the inflation rate stays high, and what we'll find is that over time in this high inflation country, treatment effects are always small, right? And that's gonna be because these firms seem to be very well informed about inflation in this high inflation environment. We're also gonna have firms in New Zealand, that's gonna be a setting where inflation is consistently low. And here we're gonna find that treatment effects are always large. All right, so let me kind of illustrate what we're going for uh, conceptually with uh, this. This is a single RCT. This is U.S. households in 2018, right? So what you do is you have a control group of households to whom you don't give any information, and then you have treated households to whom you give information. And the way we're going to measure treatment effects is essentially through this graph. And so what this graph does is it takes households and it looks at their prior beliefs about inflation and it compares it to their posterior beliefs about inflation. So essentially you go to them at the beginning of the survey, you ask them, what do you think inflation will be? And then you go to them either again at the end of the survey or three months later, uh, and you look at their posterior beliefs. And so for the control group, that's this blue line, what you find is if a household initially thought inflation was gonna be 10%, you go back to them later and they're gonna tell you, I still think inflation will be 10%. 
which is what you would expect since they didn't get any information. The other lines and the other colors show what happens when you look at firms that receive information. Okay, and usually the information in, in this case, this is we tell them that inflation has been about 2%. Okay, and what happens with these households in the US is they change their expectations a lot. So if initially you thought inflation was going to be 10%, and I tell you, hey, last over the last year it's been 2%, you're going to revise your expectations to something like 4% on average. And if initially you thought inflation was going to be 0%, you're going to revise your expectations upwards to 2%. Okay, so how flat that line is between the relating the posteriors to the priors is going to tell us how strong the treatment effect is. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at is the difference between the slope for the control group and the slope of the treatment groups. That's going to be our measure of the size of the treatment effects. Okay, so this figure is going to show the evolution of treatment effects in the U.S. over time. Okay, so the black line is U.S. inflation here. And then these, these kind of circles and squares with dashed lines, these are estimated treatment effects from RCTs that we did in 2018 and 2019 on US households. Okay, and the scale for those is on the right-hand side and you can see all these estimates around minus 0.75, which is saying that the difference in the slopes between the control and the treated firms is very large. These treatment effects are very strong. Okay, and then what happened is as the inflation rate went up, we kept doing these RCTs and what we found is that all these treatment effects, right, are much lower in absolute value, right? So the treatment effects, when we tell people about past inflation, went down to minus 0.2 from minus 0.75. So it's not full information, rational expectations, but it's, it's, it's pretty close in the sense that households are now very informed about what's been going on with inflation dynamics as the inflation rate has gone up. Okay, and that's essentially the paper. We do this for U.S. households. We do it for U.S. firms. We do it for households in the Euro area. We do it for firms in Italy. And what we kind of consistently find is when the inflation rate goes up, these treatment effects consistently go down uh, in, in, in size, right, which is consistent with households being more attentive. So now one concern with this is you could say, well, okay, so this is in every case, you have households being more attentive in kind of 21, 22. Maybe there's something else that's going on around this time period that's making people pay more attention to aggregate conditions. And say maybe it's COVID, right? So maybe around the world, everybody's more attentive. It doesn't have anything to do with inflation. So this is where the case of Uruguay is really instructive. Uh, so this is the equivalent figure for Uruguay. You can see the inflation rate is hovering around 8% through this entire time period, right? So this is a country that's, that's been experiencing higher rates of inflation. And we've been able to do the same RCTs on firms in, in Uruguay through this whole time period. And what you can see is that the treatment effects throughout this time period in Uruguay are basically zero. If you tell firms in Uruguay what the inflation rate has been or what the central bank's inflation target is, you have no effect on their inflation expectations. And that's because in this high inflation environment, uh, they're, already, they're, they're paying attention to inflation. So if you take all these RCTs together and you put them on that same graph that I showed you originally from Caballo and, and co-authors, right? what you find is the same general pattern. So here, every dot is an RCT at some moment in time in one of these regions. And what you can see very consistently is as you go to higher inflation rates, these treatment effects get smaller. Okay, So people are being uh, becoming systematically uh, more attentive as the inflation rate, uh, as the inflation environment. Uh, changes. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's our paper. Let me leave you with kind of two takeaways. Uh, one is in terms of lessons for policy communication, uh, and one interpretation that we have of our results is it means that the communication challenges for central banks are very different in low and high inflation environments. All right, so in a low inflation environment. The challenge that you run into is that people are, are very inattentive to monetary policy and inflation. OK, so in this case, what's really difficult is getting a message to them because they're not listening to press conferences. They're not you know, following newspaper articles about inflation. Uh, and so reaching them is really the challenge. But once you do reach them, right, a very simple message, this is what the inflation rate has been or this is the inflation rate that we're targeting is going to be very powerful. It's going to have big effects on, on expectations. In a high inflation environment, the challenge is very different because now the public is paying attention, 
to what you know is happening to inflation, to what central banks are doing. But changing their views becomes much harder because they're more informed. Okay, so those same messages that you pass on during this time are going to have much smaller effects on on expectations. So these are two very different uh, communication environments. The other takeaway that we have is in terms of the external validity of, of RCT. So whenever you, you do a paper with an RCT and you present it, someone's going to ask you the question of, well, okay, well, you did this in one place at one moment in time. How do I know this tells me anything about uh, other places, other times, other environments, which is, which is a fair question. And so one takeaway from our results is, look, if you run the same RCT in different countries, different time periods, but similar economic environments, you're gonna to tend to find uh, the same result, right? We can run this RCT in the US, in the Euro area for households, for firms in New Zealand, we get the same results when the environment is the same. But when the environment changes, right? The inflation rate say goes up, people's behavior changes, and then the RCTs may give you very different results. Okay, so you have to you have to be careful in terms of you know taking these these RCT results and applying them to other settings, right? It's clear that kind of the Lucas critique kicks in here. When you change the environment, people's behavior is going to change, and the findings of the RCTs uh, will change as well. All right, so that's that's all my time. So thank you very much for for your attention, for being attentive, uh, and and I look forward to the the questions afterwards. Okay, next up is um, Alexander Matthias Dietrich uh, presenting inflation preferences. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see my screen? Very good. So um, I'm presenting a paper on inflation preferences. This is joint work with Hassan Afrosi, Gerhard Müller, Christian Meister, the Manus Griftes, and Rafael Schönland. The usual central bank disclaimer applies. This is just my view or those of my authors, not those of Denmark's National Bank or the ECB for that matter. So in this project, we want to understand US consumers' preferences over monetary policy and inflation. If we look at actual US monetary policy, it's the case that Congress defines the broad goals of monetary policy in the US by giving the Fed this dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability. Yet the details, the, the, the concrete definitions within that UN mandate are very much left at the discretion of the Federal Reserve. Say 2% inflation seems to be the, the number that is most consistent with this price stability mandate. And the Fed usually takes a rather balanced approach um, towards maximum employment and unstable prices. And in this project, we really want to understand do US citizens, US consumers, agree with this view on the dual mandate that the Federal Reserve has, or would they actually prefer a different long-run inflation target, or would they prefer different rates on, on those two goals, price stability and maximum employment? There are, of course, very good reasons to set the inflation target at 2%, but they are mostly based on, on normative theories um, from business cycle models that usually evaluate the costs of higher inflation relative to the benefits of having higher inflation. For example, very prominently, um, Oli's paper on the effective lower bound, where they argue that having a bit higher inflation, um, positive inflation rate might provide monetary policy with more room to, to adjust interest rates from the effective lower bound. But there are also other views, for example, this famous paper by Milton Friedman that um, deflation in the economy is actually optimal in order to eliminate any incentives for households to economize on money. And, um, if we want to understand or move away a bit from this very normative theories about um, consumer welfare towards more empirical evidence, the actual evidence is relatively scarce from an empirical perspective. Um, we know from surveys that consumers tend to dislike inflation, but they also dislike unemployment, obviously. And um, interestingly, in the, in the happiness literature, there uh, is some evidence that the happiness in a society seems to decrease with higher realized inflation rates in the respective economy. So there seems to be a negative relationship here between welfare and um, inflation in an economy. Um, in this paper, we take a very different approach. We will take a micro level survey based empirical 
um, approach to actually ask consumers and elicit the actual preferences over monetary policy. And this idea is very much in the tradition of the stated preference or contingent valuation method that is widely used in, in policy analysis and other uh, fields, for example, environmental policy or policy decisions about infrastructure projects. So we conduct a representative survey and an online experiment on monetary policy preferences in the US, where we want to measure first as a long run instrument, what trend inflation rate consumers would actually prefer um, in the US economy. And then when it comes to business cycle stabilization, how they would basically trade off this for a stability mandate relative to a maximum employment goal. And besides really documenting those preferences that consumers might have, um, this I think is a very important um, approach for policymakers as it gives us new insights into potential differential welfare costs of inflation within certain um, groups in our economy. So let me preview our findings. We find that consumers tend to be more hawkish than their policymakers in the US. They prefer first a negative trend inflation rate in the long run, about minus 0.7% deflation on average per year. And when we talk about the dual mandate, consumers assign much higher weight to inflation compared to unemployment stabilization. So um, consumers seem to be really caring much more about um, inflation than unemployment when we ask them in the survey. And we find also that there is uh, very interesting um, heterogeneity among social demographic groups, especially those groups that have somewhat higher unemployment risk, for example, low educated or younger respondents, they prefer a more labor market oriented monetary policy. Um, and lastly, we also do an online experiment where we find that um, policy communication is in principle able to, at least to some degree, align preferences of consumers with um, actual policy. That is, if we give consumers, for example, some information on the effective lower bound and why that's a reason for monetary policy for the central bank to target an inflation rate above zero. Um, consumers tend to understand that and revise their preferences upwards. So um, in the paper, we use a representative online survey of US consumers. We ask around 1,000 consumers um, about several variables relating to monetary policy. And if you look at this very simple central bank loss function down here, that maybe illustrates it a bit better what we want to elicit here. First, um, monetary policy in this very basic model really wants to minimize the deviation of inflation from its target, but also wants to minimize the deviation of unemployment from its natural level. And um, in the survey, we first ask about the um, long run inflation rate that the Fed should try to achieve, that is the red high star, the inflation target, but then also about this relative weight that consumers assign to stabilizing inflation relative to unemployment, the blue lambda here. And um, we find that consumers on average prefer slight deflation around 0.72% deflation per year. Um, it does not uh, do any significant difference whether we ask about aggregate inflation or whether we ask about their personal prices for products that they actually consume relative to, to an aggregate price index, um, numbers that we get are pretty consistent. And when we compare that to a perceived inflation target that consumers state that the Fed actually tries to implement at the moment, um, we find that around 90%, so most of consumers really um, would want the Federal Reserve to target an inflation rate that is way below what the Fed actually does at the moment. There is interesting heterogeneity in, in this data when it comes to the long run preference over inflation. Um, for example, younger respondents seem to dislike inflation significantly less. So they state an inflation preference that is much higher than older respondents. Um, Apart from that, it seems actually to be mostly economic decisions. That is, whether you are self-employed or whether you receive a fixed wage that drive the, drives the heterogeneity, or whether you hold any financial investments, or if you prefer to hold your your wealth in or your assets in in cash holdings, which seems to very, very much influence consumers' preference over over long-run inflation. When we look at the at a, at a weight that consumers assign to stabilizing inflation relative to unemployment, 
corresponding to this parameter lambda here, um, we find that consumers assign a weight of around 57% to stabilizing inflation and a much smaller weight to stabilizing unemployment, resulting in a lambda of around 0 0.8. And comparing this to, to some numbers from the literature, this seems to be more hawkish than what policymakers usually state in the US, namely that they have a more balanced approach at the dual mandate, which would apply, imply a lambda of uh, equal to, to one around that, or which um, very recent monetary policy, uh, optimal monetary policy papers show where they argue that actually putting more weight on the labor market would be optimal. Um, for the economy, here we find that consumers, when we ask them directly, they would actually prefer to stabilize inflation much more in the business cycle relative to, to an unemployment goal. When we look at demographic heterogeneity, um, those numbers here marked in red um, give you um, those groups in the economy, that is the young ones, um, the less educated and low income respondents that actually prefer more labor market oriented policy, that is uh, those who put more weight on stabilizing um, unemployment relative to others. And this is very much in line with uh, very recent results from, from the Hank literature. For example, the paper by Gorneman and Al, where they show that it is actually asset holdings that, that consumers have that drive those preferences towards a more labor market oriented uh, policy with some consumers. Um, so as a last step, we want to understand if consumers only have those preference due to their demographic or socioeconomic situation, or if they actually have ideas about inflation in mind, really those, those um, business cycle theories that we use to, to calibrate models or to, to set an um, inflation target. So we do an online experiment where we test for several of those theories, and we find that it seems to be this idea that um, with deflation, your cash holdings become more valuable, which we call this Friedman idea here, but also some information about price comparison being easier um, when prices are stable, which seems to resonate most with consumers. They state 72 respective 91% of consumers state that this idea is, is relevant for them, um, for their decision about their, their inflation preference that, that they state in the survey. Um, and lastly, we also use those those ideas as a treatment in a follow-up survey where we basically want to understand if communication, monetary policy communication, when it gives this information to consumers, reasoning why the Federal Reserve, for example, sets an uh, inflation target that is positive, really changes consumer preferences. And here we find that treating people with a, with a communication about the effective lower bound that we set an inflation target above zero in order to have more room to stabilize the economy in times of crisis actually resonates with consumers. They understand that and tend to revise their preferences upwards. So there seems to be a potential gain for monetary policy if we really explain to consumers as a central bank why we set an inflation target at 2% um, um, instead of aligning it with their personal preferences. So let me sum up. Um, we conduct a survey of US consumers um, about their monetary policy preferences. We find that on average, US consumers seem to be more hawkish than their policymakers. Um, they prefer around 0.7% deflation per year and have um, an approach to business cycle stabilization that is much more focused on stabilizing inflation relative um, to what the Fed's balanced approach is. And um, if we confront consumers with some information about the reasoning, for example, this idea on effective lower bound, where we set inflation targets um, in the positive range, um, there seems to be some gains to be realized for policy communication in aligning those preferences with actual um, consumer, uh, with the actual policy targets. So that's what I have for today. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, thank you for presenting. Um, I see we already have some questions, so I'll get into the, to the Q&A portion right now. Um, the first question is for Ali um, from Raphael Shinley. Uh, Ali, based on your result, do you expect persistent attention as inflation re levels recede and what would that imply for potential cyclicality of monetary policy? That's that's a great question. Um, so we're very curious to see what's going to happen to these treatment effects as the inflation rate uh, comes down 
um, you know, it's not obvious that the effects will will come back down as rapidly or will, will increase in absolute value as rapidly as, uh, as they did when the inflation rate went up. Um, there's some evidence out there uh, from, you know, Enrique Mamandier uh, and, and co-authors from Michael Weber that, you know, big macroeconomic events can have very long-lived effects on, on the beliefs of the, the individuals uh, who go through them. Uh, and so that would suggest that, you know, people may be more attentive to inflation for an extended period of time. And so it could be a while before treatment effects change. Uh, we have a, another paper that we're working on where we're looking at how people's memories of inflation are related to what they anticipate about future inflation. And again, there we find pretty strong connection between, you know, if people remember prior inflations or prior disinflations, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty strong link to the, their, their forward-looking expectations. Uh, so my guess would be that, that uh, treatment effects will stay small for some period, even when inflation comes back down. But that's something we're just going to have to wait and see uh, what happens. So the ne next version of the paper, maybe we'll, we'll have some. Okay. Um, the next question is for uh, Alexander Dietrich, um, also from Raphael. Uh, um, did you uh, examine um, heterogeneity and in inflation targets for different categories? For example, would people like to see um, more stable food prices or more stable rent prices? Uh, thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Um, so we haven't um, checked that yet, whether people actually assign a higher weight within their, their preferred inflation rate to different categories, whether they actually prefer stable food prices and do not care so much about, about other prices in the economy. But I could imagine, um, also from my prior research, consumers place a lot of weight on on gas and food prices, this seems to be very salient to them. So I could imagine that they care about price stability in those um, categories much more than, say, for example, prices for, for services. But um, we haven't formally checked that yet in a, in a survey. Thank you. Yeah. OK, um, next question is for Ollie. Um, Dominic Smith, Smith asked this. I think I also had a similar question, which is, can you elaborate a bit on the impacts of your different treatments? Um, in your slides, you present information on past inflation, the Fed target, and Fed forecasts. Um, and it looked like they had different uh, slopes, um, even as the inflation, overall inflation rates changed. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Sorry, I, I went kind of quickly with those, those figures, so it was a little hard to see. But so one thing that comes out in the U.S. where we're consistently doing these uh, multiple treatments, some of which are about recent inflation, some of which are about the Fed's inflation target or the Fed's forecast, is it's true that the, the amount by which the treatment effects change is different across those treatment types. And so the largest change in treatment effects is happening when we tell households about recent inflation, okay, which tells us that what, what households are really paying more attention to and getting more information about is the actual inflation rate. Right. If you look at the, the treatment effects for the Fed's inflation uh, target, uh, it's also falling in absolute value uh, during the same time period, but not by as much. Okay, which suggests that as households are becoming more attentive to inflation and monetary policy, they're getting a lot of information about recent inflation. They're not getting as much information about uh, the Fed's the Fed's target. Okay, so. That's, that's something that's that's not getting through to households as much as what's happening to, to actual inflation dynamics. You know, it's kind of interesting from a communication point of view uh, in the sense of, okay, so maybe you can't change expectations by sharing information about recent inflation, but telling people about the Fed's inflation target is still somewhat powerful in terms of changing their, their beliefs. Like that effect is still there. Households haven't fully uh, incorporated that in, into their expectations in the same way that they have. Uh, about recent inflation. Okay. Um, we have a question from the audience for uh, for Alex. Um, would households' inflation preferences change when inflation is low? Uh, given Ollie's presentation, the answer seems like it might be yes. Um, households' inflation perceptions also might be higher households inflation preference might be higher during during the low inflation environment 
Thank you very much. Um, yes, this is of course a very relevant question, whether this preference is really say a deep parameter in a model that is exogenous from the from the business cycle, or if preferences of households for inflation um, adjust with the economic um, situation. Um, of course, we can't really redo the, the survey in the in the past, and we don't have this long time series as, as Oli has in his research project. But what we can do, we um, ask households about the inflation expectations going forward, but also their perceptions about realized inflation over the last 12 months. And we find that there is no significant correlation between either perceptions or expectations with those preferences. So this at least gives you some indication in the direction that this seems to be exogenous from um, the current economic situation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another Raphael question for Ali, which is, um, have you also looked at the treatment effects for other expectations variables, such as wage expectations or interest rate expectations? And would you expect to see different effect, uh, the same effects or different effects? Well, un unfortunately, uh, we were we were not as good about systematically measuring other expectations across different survey waves as we were with inflation expectations. So we we just don't have the same kind of variation over time in in those other expectations. We would expect to see similar patterns, uh, perhaps more muted patterns, uh, with with other expectations. Uh, but we we really can't can't check it um, nearly to the same extent as as we could with inflation expectations. Had we been more forward looking uh, when in doing these surveys and anticipated what would happen, we would have we would have been more systematic. But uh, sadly, we we were not. The ironies of being a fire researcher. Yes, <laughs> um, Alex, I have a I have a personal question for or a question for me personally uh, for you, which is. Um, I guess ex ante before senior results, I would may, might have predicted that consumers would ex prefer a zero percent trend inflation. I mean, the fact that they actually prefer, it, especially for price comparison purposes, you think you would want perfectly stable price levels. Um, and the fact that it's negative is a little, little bit surprising. I guess could you talk a little bit more about your intuition about why these consumers have negative preferences as opposed to um, preferences for a zero in, uh, trend inflation? Sure. So um, yeah, it's it's an interesting point that yeah, this inflation preference is actually negative. And so what we find in the survey, letting people evaluate different theories and re state whether this is relevant for them or not, um, it seems to be the case that it's really um, cash holdings that that drive this negative um, effect on, on on preferences. That people hold quite a significant amount of um, uh, liquid assets that don't appreciate with with inflation as as other asset classes do, and um, so they really have in mind this idea that their their assets, their cash, gets more valuable when um, inflation rates are low or when prices uh, decrease. But of course, this is just correlational evidence. So far, we cannot really um, see a causal effect here um, with this setup of, of an experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a, another question for Ollie from Simon Cheng in the audience. Uh, when the inflation rate is low, households and firms don't pay inflation, attention to inflation. Uh, and in this case, inflation, inflation treat, information treatment matters a lot. Would the, uh, does this information treatment actually change their spending or investment behavior? Uh, so when, when we looked at this in the low inflation environment, we found that changes in expectations that you generate through RCTs do translate into changes in, in spending of households. Um, we do not have spending data uh, from Nielsen for the high inflation period yet because they, they take some time in, in releasing that data. And so we cannot uh, yet assess whether changes in expectations during the high inflation environment are also generating changes in spending or the same patterns in, in spending changes. Uh, so that's, that's not something that we can answer yet. But we do know that in the low inflation environment, uh, those changes in expectations do translate into spending decisions. Okay. Um, I think we've gone through all the questions posed by the 
other panelists in the audience. Um, does anyone else have any last minute questions to, questions to ask? Okay, then I, I think this panel is over then. Um, thank you again to our speakers for presenting their work and thank you to everyone else for attending. Um, and I hope you have a pleasant rest of the morning, afternoon or evening, depending on which time zone you're in right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk.